الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Welcome to another uh, live session for uh, Ramadan And today's topic is a very important topic throughout the year Throughout one's life But it's more important to focus on it during Ramadan because of the mercy, the massive mercy that Allah Azza wa showers His slaves with during Ramadan. And uh, before I address the topic, I would like to actually address it from a different uh, angle. I would like to give you a story that embodied this act of worship of repentance. It is reported in the books of Al-Bukhari and Muslim that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before he left to the battle of Tabuk, he made this known to people. It was the practice, and this story, by the way, is narrated by Ka'b ibn Malik. He said it was the habit of the Prophet وسلم, that he would conceal his destination and would not disclose it to people, to the companions. Uh, so that if the enemy had spies or something in Medina, they would not know what he is planning or he was planning. So on that battle, because of the far distance, Tabuk from Medina is a very far distance. Because Tabuk is, uh, right now in, in, in our time, it's boring Jordan. And you can imagine how long, that's about 14, 15 hours by car, uh, so it was a long journey. And it was a very hot season. And uh, the enemy was huge in number. They outnumbered the Muslims by far. So the Prophet wasallam wanted people to be ready. So he informed them of his destination and the details so that people would be psychologically ready as well as physically ready and get prepared. Kabir ibn Malik said, there was no battle which the Prophet ﷺ fought except that I partook in it. Except this one. And he said, there was no time before that time during which I was healthier nor well off financially. I never owned two horses except for the period during which the Prophet ﷺ set out to Tabuk. So the Prophet ﷺ started getting ready and the Muslims started getting ready. And I said, okay, so I will prepare myself and get ready and join the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ took off with the Muslims and I continue to postpone and say, okay, I'll do it tomorrow and I will go try to get ready. I get busy, I get preoccupied by other things and I say at the end of the day, okay, I'll do it tomorrow or the day after and follow them. I'll reach them because the journey was, as we said, very long. So he could have caught up with them. So he said, I continue to do that and postpone my preparation and things would happen and I would say okay tomorrow I would do it and I at the end of the day I discover that I didn't do anything and then the Prophet ﷺ reached Tabuk and I was still in that state of I'll do it tomorrow I'll do it the day after and I'm postponing it and things happened and Allah Azza wa Jal I wanted but I kept postponing and Allah did not decree that I join them. And I became very saddened, he said, because whenever I went out of my house, the only type of people I would see is someone who is known to be a hypocrite from his practice, or people who are excused by Allah Azza wa a blind person, an ill person, so on and so forth. So I became saddened that I am with such people. Though I was healthy, I was well off, 
and I had no excuse. And then the Prophet ﷺ started his journey back. And when I came to know that, I became extremely saddened and depressed. And I started thinking of excuses to say to the Prophet ﷺ to get myself out of his anger. And started thinking of which, which lie should I say to get myself out of this situation. Because the Prophet ﷺ enjoined everybody to go out, except for those who are excused. And I took the opinion, I consulted my, my tribesmen, and everybody said, yeah, just, just uh, give him an excuse and get yourself out of this. And then, when the Prophet ﷺ reached al Madinah, and it was his practice that whenever he reached, he would enter, he would start by entering the masjid, perform two rak'ahs, and then attend to his business. So the Prophet ﷺ, after finishing the two rak'ahs, sat down and people who stayed behind came to him. And there were about 80 some people who stayed behind and everybody came and swore to Allah that they were excused and they had this and they had that. And the Prophet ﷺ accepted from them their excuses and their justifications and kept what is concealed in their hearts to Allah and treated them at face value and believed what they said and asked Allah's forgiveness for them. So he said, so when I came in, when he saw me approaching, he وسلم, smiled an angry smile. Because he وسلم, when he was in Tabuk, had checked and said, what happened to Ka'b ibn Malik? So he discovered that he didn't come, so he kept silent. So he, he gave him an angry smile and he said, Come forward. He said, so I came until I reached the Prophet Sallallahu and I sat down right in front of him. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him, what made you stay behind? Did you not have a means of transportation, an animal that is? He said, oh messenger of Allah. I swear by Allah that if I was sitting in front of someone else other than you, I knew that I can say anything and I could get out of this trouble because Allah Azza wa Jal had given me a, uh, how do you say that? He said, I'm very, a very skillful debater. I can debate with anyone and win the argument. But with you, I knew that I could lie. But then Allah Azza wa will expose me to you and I'll get your wrath and his wrath. And I knew that nothing that can get me out of this except being truthful with you despite it being difficult and heavy and can, can cause me uh, trials and troubles with you. But I hope for the pardon of Allah Azza wa Jal and I am not going to resort to lying. By Allah, I had no excuse. I am well off and healthy, but I just had no excuse and postponed for no reason. So the Prophet ﷺ said, addressing the companions in the gathering, he said, this man has said the truth. This man is truthful. And then he addressed me saying, stand up and go until Allah Azza wa Jal sends down something regarding you. So my tribesmen became angry at me after I left the masjid and started trying to convince me to go back 
and give it just a, a justification and excuse. And they insisted and insisted to the extent that I thought of going back and telling the Prophet ﷺ that I lied and I had an excuse. But then I asked people, were there any other people like myself who came and had no excuses to the Prophet ﷺ? They said yes. Murar ibn Rabi' and Hilal ibn Umayyah. He said, and these were very righteous and pious people. They were people who attended the battle of Badr. So I decided I'm not going to go back and I'm going to continue being truthful with the Prophet ﷺ. And then the Prophet ﷺ, and this is the real test now, the consequence of sin, the consequence of going or deviating from the path of the Prophet ﷺ and refraining from fulfilling the commandments of Allah Azza wa Jal. He said the Prophet ﷺ commanded people not to talk to us at all. So people refused to talk to us, not even returning the greeting of uh, the greeting of the salam. He said, "It is as if I am living in a place that is not my place. I I felt like a stranger." He said, "The two, the other two companions, the other two, uh, the the uh, the ones who Murara and uh, and Hilal." He said they were content of staying at home and weeping over the situation. He said, but I was the youngest of them, more energetic than them. So I was going out, attending the salah in the masjid, going to the markets, but by Allah, no one would talk to me. Not in the masjid, not in the markets, nothing. I would come to the Prophet ﷺ whilst he's sitting in the masjid and greet him with salam and then I look at his lips. Did he move his lips to respond even if I didn't hear him? And he wouldn't. Then one day, this was after a long period, I felt saddened. So I climbed the fence of Abu Qatada. Abu Qatada. And Abu Qatada was his cousin, his paternal cousin. And they loved each other very much. He said, so I saw him after I climbed over his fence. And I said, Assalamu alaikum, by Allah, he did not respond to me. Then he said, oh Abu Qatada, I ask you by Allah, do you not know that I love Allah and his messenger? First time he didn't respond. Second time, he didn't respond. The third time, he responded, but he responded with something that was worse than not responding. He said, Allah and his messenger know best. I don't know. So he said, that response broke my heart. I went down the fence, went home and started crying. Brothers and sisters, please try to visualize the situation Try to visualize the feelings of these three companions in this trial. He said, and Allah wanted to test me. One day I was passing in the market and then I saw a Christian tradesman who was going around asking, does anyone know who Ka'b ibn Malik is and point him out for me and guide me to him? So people pointed towards me and he could hear everything. He said, so the man came and he had a letter from the, uh, from Malik, from the king Ghassan, the tribe of Ghassan, which is a Christian Arabic Christian tribe in greater Syria. He said, this is from the king to you. So he said, I opened the letter and it said the following. He said, I heard, the king is addressing him now. He said, I heard that your friend forsook you and deserted you. And you should not remain in a place where you're, you are humiliated. So come to us and we will console you and treat you well. He said, when I read this, 
I said, this is yet another test. So I immediately took that and threw it in the fire and burnt it and walked away. He said, after 40 days have passed, can you imagine brothers and sisters, 40 days of being deserted by everybody in the, country, in the, in the uh, city. No one spoke to them. After 40 days, a messenger from the messenger of Allah sallallahu said, the Prophet sallallahu is commanded you to stay away from your wife. He said, should I divorce her? Is that what it means? He said, no, but don't touch her. Let her go to her uh, family's house or her father's house. So he said, I went to my wife and I said, go and stay at your father's house until Allah Azza wa decrees something else. And then you can return if you will ever return. So the wife of Hilal uh, ibn Umayyah went to the Prophet وسلم, asking permission to stay with Hilal because Hilal was an older person and he was ill. Or what was not ill but was weak. So he, she said, O Messenger of Allah, would you permit me to stay behind and serve the man? He said, yes, but don't let him touch you. No intimacy. And then he said, 10 days passed. No one speaking to me, no family at the house. He said, I felt so distressed that I felt that this entire earth, as vast as it is, I, f I felt and it seemed like it is closed in on me and it became constrained, constrained to me. Just as Allah Azza wa Jal described them in the Quran. He said, and after I had prayed Fajr, at the top of the house, at the roof of the house, and I was sitting, feel, feeling distressed and depressed and anxious. Then I heard a voice from the Mount Sala, a mountain called Sala. He said, I heard a voice screaming aloud. Ya Ka'b ibn Malik, Abshir, O Ka'b ibn Malik, good news to you. He said, I immediately went into sujood. He said, I knew that relief came from Allah. And this is good news coming regarding this matter. And there was a man who took off on his horse from the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, trying to convey this good news to me. But the voice of that man was faster than the horse. So the man who came, the, the people who came were two, the man on the horse and the man who screamed it out, who shouted it out. So when he came, I knew that this was the man who screamed it. So I had nothing to give him. So I took off my garment, the upper and the lower garment. I went in, took it, out, took it off and gave it to him as a gift for conveying that good news to me. And then I immediately went and rushed to the Prophet Sallallahu in the masjid. This is, a, this is a very touching situation and very touching moment here. He said, when, as soon as I entered into the masjid, Talha ibn Ubaidillah was the first to stand up and rush toward me and embraced me and congratulated me for Allah's acceptance of my repentance and my friends. And then he said, I will never forget this because he was the only one who stood up and did this. He said, so I greeted the Prophet ﷺ with salam and his face was so bright. It was illuminating as if it was a full moon. He said, and whenever he was happy وسلم, his face would become radiant like silver reflecting on light. He said, addressing Ka'b ibn Malik, he said, good news to you, this is the best day you've ever had since your mother gave birth to you. 
He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, is this something from you? Or is it coming from Allah Azza wa Jalla? He said, no, it is from Allah. So he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, as a token of my sincere repentance, I am going to give everything I possess from wealth for the sake of Allah. I'm going to spend it all for the sake of Allah. As gratitude to Allah's acceptance. He said, no, hold on to some of it. It's better for you. Being sincere to Allah Azza wa Jal, being truthful with Allah Azza wa Jal, and we all know ourselves whether we are truthful or not, sincere or not, and Allah knows. Allah knows what we conceal. This, these companions were truthful and sincere in their repentance, and thus they were accepted. Now let me just, in a, in a very summarized manner, mention the conditions these scholars May Allah have mercy on them, listed as uh, acceptance conditions for acceptance, for the acceptance of uh, repentance, without which the, the repentance is not valid and is not accepted by Allah. First of all, it has to be sincerely done for the sake of Allah. You're not compelled, you're not afraid, you're not embarrassed from, from people and therefore you repent. No, it has to be sincerely for Allah. You have to regret because the Prophet ﷺ said, regret is repentance. And this is reported by Ahmed and classified as authentic by Albani. Meaning it's a sign of true repentance. And then you have to immediately abandon the sin. And if the sin was related to people's rights, then you have to fulfill them, give them back or ask their pardon and forgiveness. And being determined Never to go back to the sin. Being reluctant uh, might, might not reflect that the repentance is not sincere and thus is not going to be accepted. Let's list a few uh, lessons learned from the story of Ka'b ibn Malik and his companions. The thing that resulted in the sin and him staying behind was postponement he delayed everything i will i will and this is the worst thing anyone can do is to postpone repentance or postpone fulfilling the commands of allah umar ibn abdul aziz addressed al hasan al basri and he said in a letter beware of i will postponing he said because postponing is the most vicious soldier of the devil Another thing from this story is that being sincere and truthful and saying the truth is the only way out of trouble. And this is something that we need to instill in the hearts and minds of our children, our youth. That being truthful, though it might cause you trouble in the beginning, but it's the only way of rescue on the long run and maintaining your dignity in front of others. This, the the, the uh, hypocrites were saved by lying, but were cursed by Allah. Uh, it is legislated to give a prize and, and give a gift to, the, to anyone who brings you good news. Especially if that good news is pertaining something to related to your religion. Uh, it is also legislated to go into sujood for uh, thankfulness. Sujood is shukur. When something good happens and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do that. It was one of his practices Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and as Ka'b ibn Malik did when he received the news. Very important thing brothers and sisters. No matter how grave, how serious the sin you commit is, the, the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal is more. Allah will accept it. These three did not join a battle, stayed behind in a battle. This is a grave, major, grave sin. But Allah forgave, accepted their repentance when they were sincere.
So never let the devil lure you into refraining from repentance under the pretext of what a serious sin I've committed. No, no matter how serious it is, anything less than kufr is something that Allah Azza wa Jal can forgive and accept your repentance for. And finally, from the lessons extracted from this uh, story is that the, the status of repentance is something that is uh, very great. And the uh, indication of that in the story is the reaction of Ka'b ibn Malik when he went into sujood thanking Allah Azza wa Jal for accepting the repentance because repentance is something that's serious. It, exp- it wipes out the sin. Now, though this, this uh, narration tells us only what happened with uh, Ka'b ibn Malik, however, Al-Waqidi uh, added a portion that described the reaction of Hilal ibn Umayyah. The one who went and conveyed the good news to him was Sa'id ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu and that Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal had accepted their repentance. He said, Sa'id said, he, Hilal, prostrated immediately, went into sujood and went there and stayed there for such a long time. I thought that he would die before he would ever raise his head as long as he stayed in sujood. Sujood for gratitude, for thankfulness, for such a thing, it is to reflect how great and important it is in the heart of the slave. And indeed, the status of repentance being accepted is something that is great. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing Nothing that you can do, Allah Azza wa Jal cannot forgive. 